The early 1900s represented a pivotal time for agriculture in the nation. Internal combustion tractors were replacing steam-powered machines as well as horses and mules in farming operations. In the wheat country of the Pacific Northwest, however, the steep hills had presented challenges for the early wheeled models of tractors. They didn't have enough power to pull the heavy combines, nor were they able to handle hillsides of 45 degrees and steeper. Therefore, animals had continued to dominate in this area, even as power farming equipment was becoming the norm in the flatter Midwest and California. Teams of as many as 36 horses or mules were the norm, while tractors were a rarity. But as the technology improved, farmers became more eager to take advantage of the touted cost savings and speed of operation that various types of tractors could bring. Especially critical to the adoption of power farming on steep terrain was the development of the track layer crawler tractor. There was another strong impetus for the adoption of power farming, and that had to do with the Great War, World War I. During the war, it was American agriculture that saved the Allies from starvation. Crop production increased with the demand, while food conservation became everyone's patriotic duty. Wheat was an especially valued commodity because it was easily stored and transported and was considered a staple in Europe. Farmers were eager to be more efficient in their operations for economic reasons as well as patriotic. While a man with a four-horse team could plow four acres in a day, a tractor could plow 15. The price of wheat had been fixed during the war, incentivizing the tillage of more and more land. The need for the grain continued after the end of the war, when America was helping Europe to rebuild. Tractor shows, such as this one, were sweeping the agricultural scene to promote power farming machinery and to help farmers decide the tractor question. Are they worth the investment? Ads for the events promised hill climbing tests, fuel tests, endurance tests, and many other tests to bring out the strong and weak points of each machine. Bigger companies would also bring implements such as plows, seeders, and discs, as well as threshing machines, combined harvesters, and headers. They must have been convincing expositions, as the number of tractors produced in 1918 was seven times the 20,000 produced in 1910 and production would be 10 times that amount by 1920. The tractor show of 1919 was to be the greatest show of its kind ever held on the West Coast. Although organizers were eager to site it near Spokane, Walla Walla was chosen because of its farm belt location and access to major railways and highways. Serious consideration, however, was given as to whether it could handle the predicted number of visitors which ranged from 15,000 all the way up to 60,000 persons. Located on some of the most fertile land of the Pacific Northwest, let alone the nation, agriculture was the dominant force of the Walla Walla Valley economy. Wheat was king, with impressive yields per acre due in part to the area's consistent and timely rainfall. According to William Lyman, author of Souvenir of Walla Walla County, the rain is usually distributed so as to fall just right for seeding and to omit falling just right for harvesting. Other highly productive crops grown in the area included sweet onions and sugar beets. Plus, truck gardeners were a big part of the agricultural scene, shipping out nearly 200 train car loads of vegetables other than onions and beets in 1918, including, surprisingly, 40 cars of rhubarb. The Walla Walla Tractor Show would be held in the spring of 1919 under the direction of tractor associations from Spokane and Portland. Advertising for the event was unparalleled. The commercial club didn't blink an eye when truck and tractor association officials recommended that at least $4,500, nearly $70,000 in today's dollars, be invested in a Northwest advertising campaign. 
Indeed, they said raising that amount of money would be the easy part of the project. County extension offices in the state mailed out flyers to every single farmer in their district. Folks would travel from all over the Pacific Northwest, including Montana, to join the locals to view 125 train car loads of tractors, tractor accessories, and power farming machinery. The colleges in Pullman, Moscow, and Corvallis would take part in the program, and professors from Washington State College would be the judges of the various tests of the tractor's abilities. 1,500 factory expert demonstrators would be on hand for the event, representing firms from Seattle, Boise, San Francisco, Stockton, and San Jose, in addition to those from Spokane and Portland. Attendees would also see plenty of exhibits of electrical and gas engine appliances designed to lighten the farm woman's workload. In fact, come and bring your wife was the slogan of the show. Power churns, power washing and sewing machines were demonstrated. Displays of the latest in rug cleaning appliances, portable power plants for lighting their homes or barns, and all the other newest wrinkles and household helps made the event very attractive to the ladies. Another draw for the women was a Mrs. Roy King of Portland, who, along with her husband, traveled the tractor show circuit operating Russell tractors. At a time when a woman was acknowledged only by her husband's name, she was considered a very expert operator and got a great deal of attention at the tractor shows especially from the farmers' wives. We may never know her first name. The Harv Yenny Farm, east of town, was chosen as the site for the expo, billed as a one half million dollar power farming educational event to be held April 23, 24, and 25. Then, the community of Walla Walla rolled up its sleeves to get ready for its biggest challenge ever to house, feed, and transport 60,000 people over the three days. Considering the population was roughly 15,000 at the time, it would require the efforts of the entire town, and the community was determined to provide the finest possible hospitality for each and every guest. Every club, organization, church, and private citizen was asked to step up and fulfill their civic duty by helping in any way they could. Even then, the community recognized the dollar value of tourism, and they strove to make their guests eager for a return visit. Indeed, as much emphasis was put on making guests feel welcomed and charmed by the town as it was on making the show educational. A brochure was printed by the commercial club entitled, Facts Worth Knowing About Walla Walla. Boy Scouts were enlisted to act as guides around town for visitors. Much ado was made about the townspeople showing their spirit of hospitality, while admonitions were made against any profiteering from Walla Walla's historic event. The 620 acres of farmland was well suited for the power and agility demonstrations, as it had an ample variety of grades, but there was also plenty of flat ground for the exhibits and parking. The land needed to be surveyed so that the degrees of each slope could be known for comparison of performances. Courses were laid out for the exhibition on grades from 10 to 40 percent, as well as on level ground. An unloading platform had to be built on the Northern Pacific Rail Line at Harbert Station on Mill Creek Road, from where the tractors would then be driven over the hill to the site. Therefore, roads leading to the Yenny property needed to be groomed and bridges strengthened. About 15 miles of telephone wire was strung and operators were enlisted to provide service at the show. Gas and oil stations were installed at the rail station as well as at the site, and two large water tanks were transported to the expo grounds. Where would they all stay? The housing committee sent a large team of young men and women on a citywide campaign, soliciting residents to invite visitors to share a room in their home. In four days, 1,400 rooms were secured, but many, many more were needed. President Falkenberg of the Commercial Club traveled to Seattle to procure 585 mattresses, blankets, sheets, and pillows 
but only 85 cots, through Shriners International at no charge, and had them shipped by freight to Walla Walla. This was a disappointment, as he had asked for 2,000. 200 cots were secured from the Pendleton Roundup Association. President Penrose of Whitman College notified the committee that Prentice Hall was available for 75 guests, and 50 beds would be outfitted in the college mess hall. Beds in the Whitman Gym were advertised for $1 a night, including a shower and a dip in the pool. Efforts were made to quickly transform the new YMCA building into lodging, but the smell of fresh plaster was too strong, so organizers had to turn elsewhere. The YWCA and the Salvation Army made dormitory space in their buildings, and the second floor of the Ludwig Building was set up with cots. Commercial club member E.C. Burlingame called for residents to move their families into their garages for the duration of the show so they could make more room for guests in their homes. And still, more lodging was needed, so they began looking for rooms in the outlying areas. The housing committee also spiffed up an auto camping park on East Boyer Avenue, which is the location of Wildwood Park today. They ensured access to city water and sanitary sewer, and PP&L provided several gas burners for cooking. Preparations were made to make use of any empty lots around town if still more room was needed. Providing food for thousands of visitors was also a daunting task. A restaurant committee made arrangements for the Catholic Ladies Organization and the YWCA High School Girls Clubs to prepare 4,500 lunches each day during the show. The Catholic Ladies also served evening meals downtown at the Tractor Show headquarters in the Ludwig Building. Their menu was robust and included four different meats, vegetables and shrimp salad, asparagus, baked beans, mashed potatoes, cake, ice cream, and coffee, all for 75 cents, which is about 11.50 in today's currency. Local restaurants ramped up their supplies and staff in preparation for the week. Our club agreed to provide 3,000 boxed lunches at the tractor showgrounds each day. What a daunting task. But we got ourselves organized into teams, set up assembly lines, and competed against each other to see who could pack boxes the fastest. Each team started with buttering the bread slices, then passed them along to be filled with ham, then wrapped in oiled paper. The sandwich went into a box with a pickle, a donut, and a piece of pie. And then a team member delivered the box to the box committee, who packed them into big cartons for transportation out to the grounds. My team won the prize on the first day, which was a box of chocolates. And we tied with Dorothy Moore's team on the second day. Along with the lunches at the showgrounds, we sold coffee, ice cream, and gum all three days. Then on Saturday, we sold leftover bread, pies, and donuts at a booth downtown. All in all, we made about $300 to $400 on the deal, which we will use to help pay our way to summer camp. The hardest part was getting all the cups we needed to serve all of those people. We asked everyone we knew to loan us their cups, whether they were tin or granite or china. We even had a plea in the paper. We managed, barely, but then we had to get them all back to their rightful owners. Considering that a large number of visitors arrived in Walla Walla by train, transportation to the site was also a mammoth undertaking. A second solicitation campaign was conducted, this time via mail, with letters sent to every motor vehicle owner. The Walla Walla Valley Rail Car Company would run their streetcars on a 20-minute schedule, and residents signed up to taxi people from the end of the line on East Whitman out to the site four miles east of town. Tri-State Auto Club alone pledged 62 cars for the week, or a guest could pay 75 cents for a round-trip combination streetcar plus truck ride to the site in a rig furnished by Walla Walla Commercial Club. Accounts of the event describe a steady stream of cars and trucks filled to capacity traveling to and from the expo. Interestingly, a counting of cars parked on the site at 3 p.m. on Friday allowed for the mathematical calculation which put the final estimation of attendance at 49,000 over the three days.
For visitors who drove their own cars to Walla Walla, the committee wanted to make sure they could locate the Yeni property with ease. 100 large yellow cards giving directions were posted throughout the town, and in keeping with the community's desire to be gracious hosts, citizens were asked to wear a card on their lapel that said, ask me, I live here, and avail themselves to any visitor in need of directions. Attention was given to every detail as the community readied for their guests, including entertaining them in the evenings. A series of three concerts and two operettas was organized by the Blue Mountain Music Festival Association with a chorus of 350 voices from Walla Walla and surrounding communities and accompanied by the symphony orchestra. Famous soloists were brought in and the Up to the Times News Magazine said the concerts were the most pretentious affairs of the kind ever undertaken by musicians of Walla Walla. Baseball games were organized between Whitman College and the Walla Walla Baseball Club, a town team, for entertainment Thursday, Friday, and Saturday evenings. The college team was coached by Raymond Borleski, a legendary Whitman College athlete and coach. Whitman handily won the first game, but no other results were located. The 1919 tractor show exhibits were organized in a semicircle at one end of the grounds, and lunch counters and restrooms were adjacent. Several very large tents had been erected in addition to a street of smaller ones, the length of two football fields to house accessories of power farming. Here you would find trucks, lighting plants, power pumps, stationary engines, power cream separators, household appliances, tractor sheds, car dealers, and more. Farmer's Savings Bank of Walla Walla opened up a branch office in the headquarters tent. A three-ton safe was hauled to the site on a four-wheel drive duplex truck. Our bank has a flourishing relationship with farmers as they work to extend their holdings during this boom time for agriculture. We've even hired an agriculturist to work directly with the farmers, giving advice on what size tractor they should invest in, for example. We've even set up a branch office there at the tractor show site and are ready to make change and cash checks. We want to make it as easy as possible for our customers to take advantage of the great deals offered this week, which will economize on their farming greatly. Wallace Copeland, who farms out there on Cottonwood, stopped in to tell me that he had purchased the Harris Combine that is on the demonstration grounds, and he's eager to try it out come harvest. Indeed, my assistant, Imogen King, and I are having a busy time at the tractor show. One particularly popular exhibit was the Christensen Company's compressed air starter, which allowed a tractor to start regardless of the temperature outside. Delco Light was promoting their portable electrical plant, which would be very useful for those not connected to the grid to power their cream separator, milking machine, the well pump, or light their homes and their barn. A number of giveaway items were handed out to Expo visitors. The Holt tractor booth was giving away egg beaters to the ladies, and International Harvester handed out what was described as an ingenious puzzle. International Harvester also gave away over 3,000 walking canes with centimeter and inch markings to be used by the spectators to measure the furrow depths created by the power machinery. This would assure them of the tractor's capabilities. The official program included both demonstrations and speeches by dignitaries. Officials from the USDA in Washington, D.C. and professors of farm engineering departments of Oregon Agricultural College, University of Idaho, and the State College of Washington addressed the crowd on the application of modern power farming methods. 
Demonstrations were repeated each day, categorized by round wheel tractors versus track laying type. After each group of tractors plowed for 90 minutes, they were brought back to the showgrounds, where their special features and selling points were touted by the factory experts. These men were also scheduled to give private instruction on the use and upkeep of each power machine as well as accessories. Another time in Walla Walla's history, nearly 100 years later, the entire community rallied to host a gigantic influx of visitors. In 2015, the Gentlemen of the Road Stopover Tour landed in town. The similarities are startling. The weather, crowds, transportation. Where do we house 15,000 people? Parking, emergency services. How is the little Walla Walla going to accommodate these crowds? Where's the water going to come from? The traffic's going to be a mess. How do you possibly prepare coffee for 20,000 people? Well, that's two-thirds of our population. We're going to see, as the crowds flow in down US-12, we're going to see something like the likes of which we've never seen before. Boy, we really got to have our plan worked out. We've got to be prepared for whatever hits us, and we've got to pull this off correctly. We knew it was coming, but really when Madison House first arrived and things started to be setting up with the mass size of it all, Vans opening up like transformers, roadies all over the place, making the stage. Just as we saw in 2015, Walla Walla went all out in creating a festive party atmosphere for the tractor show visitors. Professional decorators were brought in with their ladders to string streamers, bunting, and flags. Businesses decorated their storefronts, and locals decorated their automobiles. Economic impact is estimated at somewhere between seven and ten million dollars. All of our hotel rooms, our lodges, our B&Bs were full. It was not only just a great event for Walla Walla, but for Southeast Washington. It was a fun week. This was an extraordinary event for this town because it shows us as Walla Walla what we can do. The event was wonderful for Walla Walla. It probably gave me an extra week of revenue. We had wonderful music, wonderful food, wonderful camaraderie for the whole weekend. Everything went so smoothly, we had no hitches. It was just a very, very humbling and unique experience. The economic boon of the 1919 tractor show to the town of Walla Walla was very likely equal to that of the Gentlemen of the Road event. It was billed as a one-half million dollar educational exposition which in today's currency is about 7.5 million. But no economic consideration was given to the added value of the enormous Blue Mountain Music Festival. The Walla Walla Bulletin attempted a scientific estimation of the number of attendees to the tractor show over the three days, which downgraded the previous estimates of up to 75,000 persons to 49,000. Unfortunately, no actual accounting of the number of visitors hosted in the Walla Walla area that week has been found, but estimates of 15,000 are mentioned repeatedly. It is astounding to imagine the amount of effort and cooperation it took, all without the aid of social media, to host such a successful expo. The goodwill generated through community collaboration and cooperation showed through in both the Tractor Show and the Gentlemen of the Road Tour. In Up to the Times, the writer said, They came, they saw, and we conquered. Might well be the new reading of the old phrase when used in connection with the hosts of visitors entertained so royally at the recent Tractor Show. We conquered all hearts and sent away friends by the hundreds where we welcomed strangers. County agricultural leaders, commercial club secretaries, implement and truck dealers, state officials and businessmen in general were behind the enterprise. As an event in the dissemination of the knowledge of the benefits to be derived from the study of power farming, it was the greatest of the series to be held during 1919. There was not a single person that I saw or talked to or heard from that didn't say that they didn't want to come back to Walla Walla. I mean, it's really a reflection on the level of success that this city has achieved working together. 
we will reap benefits for many, many years. A question often asked is what happened to all of the horses? The transition from horses to power machinery didn't happen overnight. Often, farmers would go from having all horses and mules to some, and then to none. According to Dr. James Shepard, retired professor of economics at Whitman College, while the changeover in our region gained some momentum in the mid-20s, thanks in part to educational events such as the tractor show, the biggest decrease in animal power wasn't to happen until the mid to late 30s. During the times of transition, tractor dealers would take horses and mules as trade-in for good money. Farmers who could not afford to upgrade to power farming could come to these sale lots to restock their teams. But what happened to all of these displaced animals once tractors were the norm? According to Dr. Shepard, there were plenty of buyers who would use them in logging or would ship them to the south to work in cotton farming. His source was longtime early caterpillar dealer Clarence Braden. As anyone who has pets knows, even work animals can become part of your family. For many, giving up their hard-working, loyal horses and mules was not an easy feat. Waitsburg area farmer L.Z. Conover tells of when he was four or five years old and his father made the decision to sell off their horses as he was upgrading to power farming. There was one saddle mare on the farm which L.Z. was very fond of riding around the property. His dad did not want to be there when the horse trader arrived to pick up these animals that had been integral to his farming operation for so many years. So he arranged for the man to come while he and LZ made a trip to town. Somehow the buyer was delayed and by the time he was herding the team down Wilson Hollow Road, father and son were driving back up it. It was a painful encounter for the Conivers. There, in the midst of the departing herd, was LZ's favorite mare. LZ remembers putting up quite a squall. I was pretty upset for a little guy. In retrospect, he realizes how upset his dad must have been, losing 30 horses to his one. As it happened, that wasn't quite the end of the story. A few years later, the family was vacationing in Oregon following one of their first harvests accomplished without animals. In an extremely unlikely and lucky coincidence, there, at a farm in the Willamette Valley, grazed a few of their former horses. It was a touching moment, and the family was glad to see that their former work animals were being well taken care of. The 1919 Tractor Show has been one of Walla Walla's best kept secrets. It was a testament to the roll up your sleeves and get things done spirit of our community, as well as to our innate collaborative nature. Those qualities live on today, as evidenced by the highly successful Gentlemen of the Road Tour. It also speaks to the value of agriculture in our economic, social, and cultural history. Understanding where we have been helps us to appreciate how the tremendous advances in ag technology shape our lives today. Blue Mountain Land Trust is excited to celebrate this important centennial anniversary as we honor our agricultural roots and support farming now and in the future.